I am very happy to introduce Father Cyprian, prior of Our Lady of Guadalupe Monastery in Silver City, New Mexico. Uh, he was ordained by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in 1986. Yes, you can applaud. Yes. Just for uh, applaud uh, for in advance for when Archbishop Lefebvre is finally can canonized, which I think will happen someday. Um, and so he is here to talk to us about St. Benedict and monasticism. Uh, the, you know, our Lord said, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things will be given you besides. And if anyone wants to see proof of that, uh, just look at the history of Benedictine monasticism throughout the centuries. They sought first the kingdom of God and his justice for themselves, and then the process as a necessary overflow uh, came to be the great civilizers and cultivations of, cultivators of civilization in society. So please welcome, the, for the first time at a Catholic Family News Conference, Father Cyprian. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to speak to you this morning. To be first, they say the last shall be first. <laughs> Before I begin, you might have had some difficulty sitting down in your chair. <clears throat> One of our devious monks put the, our calendars on your chair because there's already three months of the calendar that you would never use. <laughs> so we had a few left over, and please take them with you if, if you would like to have them, and you can make a donation for whatever you think it's worth. The brothers are in the back, and they'll be happy to work with you. So I apologize for the lumpy chair. The second thing is to stay awake with the monks. <laughs> this is a fundraiser to build our new church. If you buy a bag of coffee, you're buying a stone for our new church. If you buy two or three, Better to roast now than later. <laughs> That's what Brother Bernard says. It's a Long Island, New York joke. They always ask us, aren't you hot dressed that way? So that's the answer. And then lastly, we are Benedictines, and obviously the Medal of St. Benedict is one of our big um, messages and apostolates to help your soul. And so if you, if you can't afford the Benedictine medals in the back, mine are free, <laughs> and they're blessed. So just ask, and I'll be happy to give one to you after the conference, which, as you know, the, the, the Blessed Medal of St. Benedict is probably one of the oldest devotions of the Catholic Church. St. Benedict dates back to the 5th century, and the protection, the blessing, the protection, the exorcism, all the characteristics of this medal of St. Benedict, we perpetuate and we still uh, bless them the, the uh, original, original way. So these are for you if you wish, just simply ask if you would like a supply of them, the brothers have them at the table for you if you wish. As well as other, other uh, products for the monastery, we, <clears throat> we try to encourage a simple life, and my, my notes are written by hand with a, uh, a 
a fountain pen. <laughs> so we sell those things in the back. <laughs> so old fashioned is, is in, in vogue right now. Mr. Venari asked me to speak about St. Benedict today. What a great privilege to, to be a son of such a great father and to, to talk about one's father. St. Benedict is the father and the founder of the oldest religious order in the church. It is true in history that other communities existed, other forms of religious life existed, as we say back in, in that era, to, to situate the Benedictines for you, or, or the, the time of Saint Benedict himself. He was born in 480 and died in the middle of the, of the uh, 500s. And so this is approximately five centuries after the time of our Lord. So the, the, the monastic orders patterned after St. Benedict represent a wave after a series of waves, if we could use that, that word. First, our Lord and the apostles. This we will call the, the apostolic era. And then, after them, the, their disciples. As you know, the apostles' primary mission in the church was to be eyewitnesses, to give the first-hand knowledge of the truth of the church and to communicate their personal knowledge of our, of our Lord. So a first-hand eyewitness, this was the, the, the efficacy of their mission because the man they knew and saw and lived with, our Lord Jesus Christ, this was their great message and that personal knowledge of him was their preaching. And then their disciples, the, those who were trained by the apostles, ordained by them, formed by them, they would be called the apostolic fathers. And then after them, the, those who would begin to write down and to record these messages, these sermons, these teachings of the, of the apostolic era, these would be called the church fathers. And then those who would re react to this teaching, those who were listening and hearing this, these testimonies would, would want to turn these, these sacred words, these, these words on fire from the Holy Ghost and to, to live these teachings. These are called the Desert Fathers. And they would leave everything just like the apostles. Behold, we have left all things. What, is, what shall be our reward? And so they were the ones who took these words literally and left their, their families, their villages, their work, and went out to the deserts to, to, be, to live with God, forsaking all other things. And they would be the model. They would be the, become the models for applying the teaching of our Lord and the apostles and the fathers in, in, in concrete terms. And they were the first monks. And then the monastic fathers would follow. And this would be from the, the time of St. Benedict. We're talking approximately the 5th century. And then throughout the remainder of, the, of the, middle, the early Middle Ages, what we call the Dark Ages, up until about the year 1200. So this is where we, we situate 
this, this time frame of our father, St. Benedict. We say that other religious did exist before him, these, these desert fathers, and, but nothing, nothing like the idea of what a religious order would become under St. Benedict's inspiration. Nothing had ever, had ever seen what he was about to do to the religious ideal and the religious life in the church. And the order of St. Benedict would become the model for all religious life in the church and, according to canon law, the model for all Catholic life, using the religious as the ideal, as, as the, that to which we must compare ourselves to, to realize our, our spiritual progress. And this ideal is simply a life lived in union with God, a life lived at peace with God. And on this foundation, we have the, the, the wonderful result, which is 50,000 canonized saints of one religious order. If you put them all in one place, that would make a big city, a city of saints. The Benedictine order truly is a city, a great mystical, spiritual city of saints. It was Cardinal Newman who described the history of the church in three ages. This he did as an educator. He was, his primary work in the church was education, formation, teaching. And so he, he perceived this, this vision of the church dividing into three ages, three principal ages, based on three religious orders, perhaps the three principal religious orders of the church. I borrow my, my, my words from his, his uh, teachings from this vision of the church. So first, obviously, the first age of the church, according to the cardinal, is the Benedictine age. That is the early, the early age of the church. The second age would be the Dominican age, coming from the, the high or the heart of the Middle Ages. And then thirdly would be the Jesuit age, what we might call the modern, the modern age. And so first, the, the idea of the Benedictine age, the early age of the church, St. Benedict as the, as the personification of this era. Secondly, the Dominicans, we imagine, obviously, St. Dominic, the founder, a great miraculous preacher and educator, converter of souls, a destroyer of heresies, and of course, St. Thomas Aquinas. But as, as you know, St. Thomas Aquinas was trained by the Benedictines <laughs> and spent his childhood being trained at Monte Cassino, which is the mother house of the, the Benedictines. And the Jesuits, St. Ignatius was a soldier who laid down his sword in the Benedictine Abbey of Montserrat in Spain. And so already we see elements of the, the residual effects of the holiness of the Benedictine order and the spirit of our father, St. Benedict. In these, 
in these uh, other great historical fig figures and, and founders. The Benedictine age, Cardinal Newman's vision of the first age, the early age of the church, would be that of a departure, a departure, a flight from corruption, the chaos, what the imitation of Christ calls the fuga mundi in Latin, which is the flight from the world. Because this idea of the world, there are many ideas of the world. There, there, are, there are positive ideas, and there are, are obviously the, the negative ones. And what we call the worldly spirit, obviously, is that spirit which, which militates against the divine order, or which ignores, ignores God. And so necessarily, this, this idea of fuga mundi, for the imitation of Christ, would mean a separation from the ungodly, a flight from that which is false, the false order of man. When in St. Benedict's time, which was the end of the Roman Empire, where the Caesars declared themselves to be divine, the St. Benedict's age would be the, the collapse of the Roman Empire. St. Benedict fled the corruption of Rome in order to live in close union with God. By living like the apostles, who lived only for our Lord, as his disciples and his intimate friends. Cardinal Newman sees the Benedictine age as it was situated in the Dark Ages. And he sees this as an antidote, not a reaction so much as a positive response, by which the first monks made a way of life where everything is religious, where everything is part of an integrity which seeks to appease divine justice since the virtue of religion is part of the virtue of justice. The center of the Benedictine life is the worship of God. All else surrounds it and supports it like the tabernacle that encloses the Blessed Sacrament, like the sanctuary that surrounds the tabernacle, like the church that encloses that sanctuary, like the monastery which is constructed around that church. And then, beyond the buildings, the fields, the fields that supply the wheat for the host, the vineyards that supply the grapes for the wine, the mill which grinds the flour, and the press that makes the wine for the mass. So this way of life which, which is centered upon the true presence of God upon the earth, the real presence through the blessed sacrament, the presence of the church, which is constructed around that sacramental presence of our Savior. And then that way of life, which is built to surround these realities. This is the Benedictine way of life and the, the model for Christendom. We, we travel to Europe and we see the same thing. We see the villages 
constructed in a circular form around the church, around the monasteries, then the, the people with their homes around the church, and then where they work, the fields outside the villages, where the, the work of their hands supports this way of life. And this self-sufficiency, this, this uh, reciprocity of work and service of the church is the Benedictine ideal. And so this, this structure, this genius of St. Benedict of work and prayer that surrounds the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the divine office, which is the official prayer of the Church, which continues the Mass like a sustained echo of the one worship of God. The Benedictine age is the primacy of divine worship and the way of life which lives only for that end. Now this Benedictine era was until, as we say, the early Middle Ages, the year 1000 and the year 1200, more or less. Next is the Second Age, as Cardinal Newman describes it, the Second Age of the Church, which is the Age of Greatness, the Golden Age, where science and higher learning, the focus of theology, is the specialty of universities and institutes, which until then were very rare, in which the scholastic method and the speculative find their exalted place of honor. A life of study and learning. This is the Dominican age where St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us the conquering of ignorance, which is the effect of original sin. This conquering of ignorance would take place through the acquisition of knowledge. And so education, which means in Latin, educere, to lead out of. So knowledge, which leads us out of our condition of unoriginal sin, our condition of ignorance and malice, to lead the mind out of these, this state. The third age, according to Newman, is the Jesuit age, the modern age, our age, which is the age of the practical, the age of the pragmatic, where schools make use of method and the technical to use what the world will offer in collaboration, despite its possible dangerous promiscuity. Promiscuity means a wrong mixed mixture. And where good and evil are mixed. The Jesuit age seeks to form the masses or to influence vast numbers, to see school and society as systems. But now, today, the once great schools and the convents full of teaching nuns that made that work because it was a delicate balance to, to have a complete faculty of religious who would not require the salary of a layman who had a family to, to support. These convents of religious and the school convents, which are very famous as well, they're empty today. 
and in the state of desolation. The idea of a consecrated religious, consecrated to God, to his service, to a life of, of the religious ideal, prayer, sacrifice. The church wanted to have this as the, the organ of teaching, of education. This kind of person who would be committed entirely to God to communicate that commitment, that union with God to the students. And that would be the, the fundamental um, foundation of the teaching. Everything else would be on top of that. And the, the uh, different uh, subjects that we learn in school would only come after that example from the teaching religious. And the Jesuits inspired many congregations of both men and women who would commit their lives to the vocation of education of the youth. Where are they today? Where are they today? I was formed by the school sisters of Notre Dame. And I remember, I remember when my contemplative vocation began to wake up as I would daydream in school, in class, and the eraser would, <laughs> would uh, impact my uh, early efforts at contemplation. <laughs> or a piece of chalk. Those were the 60s. And I went back, and the school is no longer there. It was torn down, and the nuns are no longer there. And I wanted to, to show Sister what she was able to produce with the uh, ricochet effect of uh, her teaching tools. <laughs> I could not find her anywhere. I think she's still alive although probably elderly, and hopefully um, preparing her soul for eternal life. They were wonderful nuns, and we, keep, we pray for them, certainly, and, but certainly uh, they're gone. They're gone. And no successors. No new waves of generations of new vocations coming in to replace them. And it is truly a crisis. The Jesuit age, this third age, according to Newman, and this, as you know, he spoke from his own personal experience, so over one century ago, which was his lifetime, called that an age of crisis and um, of decadence. What would he say today? So Newman saw the modern era as a new dark ages. And he felt the need, the answer, would be to return to Benedict. This would be the cure. Back to Benedict. And to go back to the, to the foundations, to the essence to the purity of that, that thirst for God himself. And to use that as the genius to rebuild, to restore. And truly, our future, our near future, if indeed we are to witness a great, as we all sense a great upheaval of some kind in society, in our economy, in our government, some great disaster looming, some kind of collapse or chastisement. Something is on the horizon. We thank God he keeps it a secret.
So we are facing, certainly we are facing a great restoration, which requires a great remedy. And this will certainly parallel the same, as we were saying, the same positive response the same Benedict made in his age when also every, it seemed that all was lost and hopeless. He says the answer is God alone. God alone. This was what the, the, the monks of old would write on the top of their letters. The first thing they would write would be in God alone. Soli Deo. To God alone. And as a spiritual exercise, we were told to, to write letters to God. Intimate letters of love to God. And I gave a retreat one year to some young ladies at the Dominican school. And I said, for your retreat, I would like you to write a letter to God. A letter to God? How do you start? Dear God. <laughs> I said, no, you don't do that. You don't call God by his name. Just like the, the Israelites, you don't say that name. You write uh, something beautiful to, to start. The most beautiful words you could think of. And they wrote their letters. Very, very beautiful letters, I have to admit. And then I burned them like, like incense and prayer. I said, I'm, I'm not going to read them. It's between you and God, because to God alone. Soli Deo, only to God. So they were very relieved to, that their letters were not being read by a human being. One day our teacher said to us, if God alone is the answer, what was the question? What was the problem, if this is the answer? Our present dark ages seem to want anything that is the opposite of God. St. Benedict says the monk must seek God. He is that, that race, the generation of those who seek God, quoting from the sacred scriptures. Not that God is lost or the monk is lost or that God is, is hiding, but the soul is made only for God only for union with God. The person of St. Benedict, therefore, shines forth like a great light sent by God to be the model in the work of restoration. For that which has been the beginning, that which is the very essence of Christendom, that which is the total focus on the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. If this is indeed the essence of, of Catholic society and of true religion, the same will also be its restoration. The same will produce its total restoration. Benedict means blessed, blessed of God. And the description that we have of St. Benedict is a little Latin phrase. Benedictus scienter nescius et sapienter indoctus. Benedict was scienter knowingly, nescius ignorant. 
and sapienter, wisely, inductus, unlearned. Benedict was knowingly ignorant and wisely unlearned. His life was a long series of miracles. We know the person we meet, we encounter the person of St. Benedict in two ways. As if to look through two eyes to see and to, to admire what God can do to one man. The first would be through the rule. Saint Benedict did not write the rule of Saint Benedict. At least he did not call it the rule of my, my rule. He called it the rule for monks. And he also called it the rule for conversion. And the second way of seeing, of knowing Saint Benedict would be through the biography of St. Gregory the Great, called the Dialogues of St. Gregory the Great, Pope St. Gregory the Great, the Benedictine Pope. The Order of St. Benedict has given the most popes, doctors, confessors, and martyrs and virgins to the church than any other order. And these uh, comprise a great part of that 50,000 uh, number. So the rule, the rule for monks, later called the rule of St. Benedict, and this little book, which St. Benedict calls the rule for beginners, the rule for beginners, kind of in the same, the same, uh, unsuspecting irony as St. Thomas Aquinas who calls the Summa for beginners. A compendium of basic knowledge for beginners, the Summa Theologici. So I think he borrowed the idea from someone before him. The rule for beginners, regula incuantis. The root is a code of life lived around, a life lived around the sacred, a manual for rebuilders, a book of principles, a summary of the entire teaching of the Gospels, a compendium of harmonies where we are taught what must work together if we are to win. Because there is a crisis. There is a war. There is a great battle being waged. And we have been passed the torch of tradition handed on, just like the Greeks who would light the flame for the Olympics and then run to where the Olympics were being played, run to Rome, run to some other great gathering place for all the world's competitions, passing, handing forward the torch of the, of the agonia. The word in Greek, agonia, means struggle and, and uh, competition. Obviously, it, it opens our mind to agony in the garden of the olives the final competition and unto our redemption. So this handing on of the torch for, these, for this, this particular application where we receive this light of tradition and now it is in our hands to, to do with what we desire to do the best and to give ourselves, to commit ourselves completely without reserve 
to this, this final battle and of which St. Benedict gives us the ingredients, the means to, to be victorious. And so according to the rule of St. Benedict, these, as, as, as we call them, these harmonies, these collaborations, these, this unity and integrity where disparates come together is where body and soul are no longer enemies, but must now be friends. The two must collaborate. The body must serve the soul, but the soul must be trained to lead. The spiritual must come first. It must precede the material. The soul must come before things. The spirit before the corporeal. Because, because of the nature of the battle, it is a spiritual combat. In chapter 4 of the rule, I quote from the rule as if, as if you knew it already. And a friend of mine was a worker in a car factory. And those were the days when you took your lunchbox. And he worked with almost... 99% anti-Catholics, non-Catholics. And he was always asking for ammunition, what to answer when they, when they challenge his, his, his Catholic faith and his, his uh, <coughs> Catholic identity. And so he took his lunchbox and took everything out and decorated the inside to look like a church. He would open his lunchbox, a miniature altar, holy cards, statues, and around the bologna, and then the peanut butter would be uh, a rosary, and or a um, Benedictine medal, and, and it, would, it would jingle and rattle when he would open it up on purpose during lunch hour. And Inside was a rule of St. Benedict, was a, a, a rule of St. Benedict, an imitation of Christ, and a New Testament in Psalms, the three books that every man should have in his, his lunchbox. <laughs> his name was Jack. And don't forget Jack's lunchbox, because that is the answer. And to open that box was to open the church to all those who would, who would wonder what is, what is for lunch today with Jack. And every man should have those three books because every man is also, must have something of the monk in him, something of the rebuilder, something of the man of God, something of St. Benedict because he is the man's man. So I quote from the rule, knowing that you're going to go buy a, a rule after the conference. <laughs> Chapter 4, as I was mentioning, contains a, a long list of 72 good works. And St. Benedict says these are the tools of the spiritual craft used by those who would take up this rule, not just the monks, but any man or woman, and apply them unto their salvation and to the rebuilding of Christendom. In artwork, St. Benedict is frequently shown with standing first of all, and with a finger to the lips to be quiet. Because, and then in his hand usually is a rule portrayed either in a painting or a statue. And we see these uh, in, in, on holy cards most often. And on the rule, the first word of the rule 
on one page, and on the other page, the last word of the rule. The first word is in Latin. Since the rule was written in Latin, St. Benedict spoke Latin as his language, which became Italian. Ausculta. In, in Latin, that first word, ausculta, means listen. Listen. And then on the other facing page, the last word, et pervenies. Pervenies. Listen, and you will make it. You will arrive. And so, in between that first and, and, and last word of the rule, 73 chapters, just like the scriptures, 73 books. How to please God. How to please God. Listen, and you will overcome. Listen, and you will arrive at the goal. Listen, and you will be victorious. How? These, these 73 chapters explain how. And how to please God, as we say, who is a father. How to be a son of a father. How to be a man, then a man of prayer, a man of God, but first a man. And how to see contemplation, contemplative prayer being seen as the greatest and most intense activity the most energetic of action because the action of the soul is greater than that of the body. And we define the excellence of anything by its purpose or its end. The excellence of anything is qualified by its end and its objective. And the object of contemplation is God himself who is pure act as defined by philosophy, St. Thomas and so on. God is pure act. If we contemplate God who is pure act, that is the greatest of actions of the human being. Therefore contemplation is pure prayer and man's greatest act. The root of St. Benedict is built upon this divine order where the things of God come first. The rule exalts many ancient things. And as Carl Newman was saying, these things of old must be revived and brought forward in time to live now because these tools, these principles, these causes, these elements of restoration are what is, are needed today. And one of the greatest is again, one of these beautiful ancient words, discretio, discretion that ancient word would mean, which means balance, the balance of many things. In this case, ora et labora, prayer and work, soul and body, mind and heart. The rule exalts our return to God through the vows of religion, poverty, chastity, obedience. Or stated in more ancient words from Christian antiquity, since the fifth century again is the time of St. Benedict in which he lived. Obedience, stability, and conversion of life. These are the vows of the monks. Therefore, obedience in his rule, St. Benedict teaches the love of, of, of authority, the love of hierarchy, the love of structure, 
the love of order. To these does obedience find worthy and honorable submission. Also, the rule teaches us to flee reasoned obedience, rationalism, whereby we only obey if we agree. And since we are prone to ignorance, we might not understand the motives of our superiors. Stability, the love of perseverance, patience, long-suffering, not to lose courage and to become a deserter during a prolonged war, as we live in today, a prolonged crisis. This is stability, to be fixed in God, in the, in the heart of God, united to him. And then this would, would have an effect on those around us. And to go where we are sent, as if to consider everything that we do a mission from God. And to consent to live in peace with those who are also called by God. The bond of unity above and beyond the bond of blood which unites a family is the bond of the precious blood of our Savior. God handpicks each religious, male or female, and from all eternity selects his vocations. And they are to live together bound by the fruits of our Savior's passion, the cross. Therefore, the precious blood, a higher blood than the blood of the human family. And so more unity, more charity, more harmony. And lastly, a conversion, to rise above the status quo, because virtue can only be tested by resistance, by challenge, by temptation. We pray the Our Father many times every day, asking to be delivered from temptation. But that kind of proof of love and of virtue is what God allows to make us stronger. Our Lord told Josefa Mendez, Mendez, uh, Menendez that I love more to repair and restore than to create from nothing. Why? Because it requires more love, more patience, and therefore it is greater. So this conversion, this reparation, this restoration on the interior of the soul, where we have suffered the most, is in God's eyes the greatest. Allah reminds us that the heart must be the first to change. If we are to convert or to convert others to the one true church, first we must convert. And what part of us first? The heart must first convert. if all else is to change, according to the heart. St. Gregory the Great shows us this final way to, to know St. Benedict in the few minutes that remain. As we say, St. Benedict's life was a long succession of miracles. Miracles by their nature are all restorative repairing, and St. Benedict's life was the same. The first miracle he, he performed was to repair a, an earthenware sieve, and broken, dropped by accident. And through prayer, it came back together and could never be even noticed that it had been cracked. And that hangs in the church. His, the church of his childhood. And then one day the monks were working and there was, the early monks were all barbarians. 
converted from the Lombards to the Goths, the invaders of, of Italy, these are our fathers. <laughs> the first monks were all uh, um, assassins, um, rough, rough types, our fathers. One day, this goth was working hard, and maybe too hard, and his tool flew off at the handle. Have you ever heard that expression before? It's in the rule, it's in the life of the fifth century. You've heard that before. And it flew into the, a nearby lake, and St. Benedict saw, and he said, don't be upset. And he took the handle, and plunged it into the water, and the iron tool came to the surface, back onto the handle, and gave it back to the goth. Now work, but not like before. Work in peace, and balance, and calm. Serve God when you work. And then one day the kitchen ran out of oil, olive oil. St. Benedict through prayer, Restore the oil, which is the symbol of charity. One day the monks were working, building. is a tradition of the Benedictines to build their, their place. And a monk was crushed by a falling wall and died. And St. Benedict, through prayer, brought him back to life. Another day they were trying to lift a stone to cement it into the wall. And they couldn't pick it up. And St. Benedict says, pray harder and you will see what I see. And a devil was sitting on that rock. Wow. And Monte Cassino was St. Benedict's first great foundation, which would become the mother house of all the Benedictine monasteries throughout the world. But first, upon arriving there, he had to destroy the altars of the pagan gods. And if you want peace, prepare for war. And so that peace of the Benedictine order, which is its model, peace, pox. First, we have to reorder, restructure, restore, and remove obstacles to the faith, like the pagan idols. I close with the five promises made to St. Benedict. One day in a vision, St. Benedict received this message from Almighty God who loved, who loved the, the monks and loved Benedict, blessed of God, as we say, as his name says. The first promise that God made to St. Benedict, to our father, is that this order would continue to exist to the end of time, to the end of the world. There would be Benedictines. Secondly, the order of St. Benedict at the end of the world, in the final battle, will render great services to Holy Church and confirm many in the faith. and will give many confessors and martyrs to the church. Thirdly, no one shall die in the order whose salvation would not be assured. And if a monk begins to lead a bad life and does not amend, he will fall into disgrace or be expelled from the order, or he will leave it on his own accord. But those who stay within the order will be assured of salvation. Fourthly, anyone who persecutes the order of St. Benedict and does not repent will see his days shortened and will die a bitter death. And lastly, all who love the order of St. Benedict will obtain a happy death. God bless you.
Thank you, Father Cyprian. It's, uh, it's terrific to have a priest such as Father Cyprian uh, give us a presentation because you kind of get a conference and kind of get a concentrated retreat. So uh, we're very grateful to him and his roasting brothers uh, <laughs> for being here. To the, I think everyone has seen this, but in case you haven't, um, the February issue of Catholic Family News, of which we have outside, has a full interview with Father Cyprian, pictures of the monastery, and uh, please uh, take advantage, these are free by the way, so please take advantage of these and, um, and get to know the Benedictines and St. Benedict better. So we'll take about a 15 minute break and we'll be back to talk about St. Francis of Assisi. come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not continue to offend our Lord, who is already deeply offended. Final vision on October 13, 1917. Our Lady silently held out the scapular, a gesture which indicates that she wants everyone to wear it. Our Lady said, if my requests are not heeded, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, raising up wars and persecutions against the Church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated.
The Blessed Virgin gave us a message how to have world peace, that only, that only she can help us. But perhaps we don't get enough perspective. We say, well, nothing dramatic has happened. And it's because our commentators, our newspapers, our editor writers, the people that we really pay attention to, the people that speak on television in the mainstream press and so forth, people who are under the pay of the enemy often, have yet to point out to us that since we have despised Our Lady's message as a, the human family, we've despised it, there have been 1,686,570,000 violent deaths as a direct result of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima. That is, again, one billion. That is one with nine zeros after it, plus another 686 million people who have died violently for the one simple reason that we've ignored Our Lady of Fatima. We could point out, perhaps another time, that if this is not enough perspective to give us that in these 95 years of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima, we have paid a tremendous price. But as bad as that is, that price will be doubled or tripled in the next couple of years if we ignore her much longer. Just a few months ago, the world's population passed seven, seven billion people. Seven billion people. <laughs> Scripture tells us, and other prophecies tell us, that one third to two thirds of the entire population of mankind will be wiped out in this war to come. I don't know what it takes to wake us up. Maybe we have to find it on NBC or CBS or some commentator in the New York Times before we finally take this seriously. And maybe we say to ourselves, we take it seriously, but I think we don't take it seriously enough. We have many priorities. Sometimes I wonder how I get through my day between what I'm supposed to do today, between getting up and doing my reading, uh, doing my other work, talking to people that, that God wants me to talk to and so forth. And we only all have 24 hours a day. And I'm sure that my life is not as busy as the bishops and the, and the pope. But we must make this priority number one. There is nothing more serious, nothing more important, nothing more urgent than Our Lady's message at Fatima. And this is something that I don't know how to say. I remember getting a letter from an older bishop many years ago. I think he was in Ottawa. And he said to me basically in his letter, Father Gruner, if you would not raise your voice so much, if you would not yell at us, we might start paying attention to you. And I said, wrote back to him and I said, I appreciate very much your interest and your concern and your advice. Now, if you can tell me how I can do that any better than what I'm doing and get the attention, I'd be very happy to do it. I hate yelling at people. I hate raising my voice and I hate trying to draw attention to myself. But there's no other way around on this message. If there's something more important and certainly yesterday we were in this March for Life here in Rome, and the number of people that are killed by abortion since about 1980-75 by the statistics we, we looked up is about 1,300,000 people. And by war, there's another 78 million people. And then by government murder, not only in Russia and China, but other parts of the world, 238 million people. These are catastrophic, and they lead us to think that we are, as Pope Pius XII, rather Pius X, St. Pius X said, that we are in the days just before the coming of the Antichrist. These proportional, these things that are happening to us, which Pope Benedict, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, said, that refer to this Fatima message is found in sacred scripture, that we are living the times of the apocalypse, and although we can be distracted with everything from daily newspapers to uh, 
new movies or whatever else it is that, that, in, that entertains us, these things are happening around us and they're happening every day. And they're happening in such a way that uh, how can we deny that we're living in, if it's not the apocalypse, if it is not the, the time coming before the Antichrist, it is the best, uh, shall we say, um, uh, preview or uh, event which would, the world has never seen before. Just looking at the Catholic Church, for example, the only other time in church history that comes close to this time is the Arian crisis, when 90% of the bishops were Arian. And there was only one, about three or four bishops who actually stood up. And the greatest of them all, St. Athanasius, was actually excommunicated by the Pope in 357 AD. Now, he wasn't really excommunicated because as the church has always recognized, as St. Thomas points out, that law is not something that just the legislator says. Law is the ordination of reason. It is for the common good. And as the church law to this day points out that no one can be punished if he doesn't commit a crime. So because Athanasius was standing up for the faith, because he was defending the faith, which was his duty to do, he could not be punished even if the Pope pronounced a sentence of excommunication. In fact, Liberius regretted his action, but Liberius is the first Pope not to be canonized from the time of St. Peter to the year 357. It's well for us to remember then that we need not be afraid of the judgments of men if we are on the right, on the right side of God. It's a principle that we need to keep in mind. We also have to understand that, that prophecy is a function in the church. It's a function that will never go away. It's a function that must be respected, just as the apostolic offices must be respected. As St. Paul tells us in Ephesians, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, not just the apostles. The role of prophecy is essential. Scripture tells us that we must not extinguish the spirit. We must not despise prophecy, but we must test all things and hold fast that which is good. So that is why I've promoted the message of Fatima, not only because it's unique among all the messages, but of course it's been approved by the church. As Father Joseph St. Marie pointed out here in Rome, he's the one who wrote the speech for the Pope in 1982 when he went to Fatima. Father Joseph St. Marie points out that it is the role of the hierarchy to judge, to test whether the prophet speaks the truth. But once the hierarchy recognizes that the message comes from God, then the Pope himself and the bishops are bound to obey, not the prophet, but God who speaks through the prophet to them. That obligation is primordial. That is not for us to say, I'm telling the Pope what to do. No, but Our Lady Fatima is telling him what to do. All I do is explain what it means. I answer the objections of theologians or others who haven't had the time to think about it. So when we get back to 1917, Our Lady comes. She comes and gives a message to show mankind the way to peace. She was asked, she was insisted that she come. She comes and she explains. And then for the next 95 years, we basically ignore her. So our Lord himself in 1931 explained to the Pope and the bishops something, a lesson from history. He said, make it known to my ministers, given they follow the example of the King of France, in delaying the execution of my command, like the King of France, they will follow him into misfortune. What is that, what is that example he's talking about, the King of France? On the 17th of June, the, to the very day, the 17th of June, 1689, our Lord spoke to St. Margaret Mary and told her to tell the King of France to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Now the kings of France, there were three of them from that day, all ignored St. Margaret Mary's prophecy 
and our Lord's command through St. Margaret Mary. Even during her lifetime, St. Margaret Mary was known as a saint. She was not some, she was well hidden, but she, her reputation for sanctity was well known among her contemporaries. And so for them to ignore this, they paid with their lives. On the 17th of June, 1789, that's 100 years later to the day, the King of France was stripped of his authority by the Third Estate. Three weeks later, the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille, on the 20th or 21st of January, 1994, his head was cut off by the soldiers of the revolution. And our Lord makes reference to this and says, make it known to my ministers, given they follow the example of the King of France, in delaying the execution of my command, like him, they will follow him into misfortune. Up until now, basically, the popes and the bishops around him have ignored, have delayed, have had one excuse after another. Uh, I think I've heard them all. And as we've had proven at these conferences before, none of those excuses really hold water. There is really no excuse for not doing it. However, that is not their choice up to now. And so we have a choice here. Of course, none of us are the Pope. None of us can command the Pope. Only he has the authority to command in the church himself or others, all the rest of the church. But we have, we are not without resources. We will talk about this in another conference. But it's not just for the Pope. As the Pope himself, speaking at Fatima two years ago, said, what is foretold in the secret is the passion of the church. And yes, there's a persecution of the Pope, but the church, the Pope is within the church. And so it's not just the Pope that suffers the passion coming up, but it is the church also. In the final vision on October 13, 1917, Our Lady silently held out the scapular, a gesture which indicates that she wants everyone to wear it. Our Lady makes miracles happen all the time, and the Pope, of course, I think if it's up to Our Lady, he's going to view this DVD and see what we have to say and see the trouble we're in. Governments, social societies, and sadly even many parish priests and diocesan bishops, even some Vatican officials are not responding seriously and properly to these diabolical threats to our lives and souls that we face today. Holy Father, your flock is desperate, vulnerable, and confused amidst the catastrophic dangers their lives and souls are in. We are deeply concerned for the future of our children and, most important, for the welfare of their souls. The whole world is despondent and unified in one anguished cry. What hope have we? Holy Father, you hold that hope. That solution is in the palm of your hand. Only you can save your flock and the world. And that is by obedience to the holy request of the Mother of God herself, Our Lady of Fatima who said of herself, 
only I can help you. All she asks is for you, Holy Father, together with all the Catholic bishops of the world, at the same time to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. A mere five minute prayer. Holy Father, you need not worry about any repercussions or threats that we all hear about today are being hurled at him. Have confidence, Holy Father. Have confidence in Our Lady's promise. Heaven does not make mistakes. God created the miracle of the sun and fulfilled prophecies made at Fatima for you, Holy Father, so you would believe and do as Our Lady of Fatima requests. Trust in the loving guidance that Our Lady of Fatima gives you. Trust in her maternal promise of protection as you yourself have nurtured your flock to do. Our Lady requested the consecration of Russia, not the world. She was specific and Our Lady does not mince words. Please, Holy Father, take Our Lady's words seriously and literally. We cannot change a formula prepared in heaven by God himself, which he sent you through his Holy Mother. Holy Father, when you baptize a baby called John Paul, you don't say, I baptize all the babies in the world. It would not be valid. Holy Father, when you consecrate a new church, our Lady of Fatima Church, you don't just say, I consecrate the churches in the world. It would not be valid. Without mentioning John Paul by name, you would not have effected that baptismal consecration. You would not have set aside that specific baby, John Paul, for God. Without mentioning Our Lady of Fatima Cathedral by name, you would not have effected that consecration. You would not have set aside that specific cathedral for God. Neither, and I must emphasize this, neither can you effect the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary if you do not mention Russia by name. Consecrating all the countries in the world again does not set aside Russia for God. The consecration would be invalid and it does not and it will not have the promised effect. Holy Father, you better than I know this. You are our shepherd. We look to you for guidance and protection against the diabolical forces that prey after our souls on a daily basis. And so we are confused as to why you have not done the consecration of Russia according to the formula Our Lady requested and which God himself commanded. Holy Father, time has run out. Our Lady offered us the only solution, but only through you. Every day of delay in making this consecration Many, many more souls and lives are lost. Today, even thousands upon thousands of souls are already being persecuted, tortured, imprisoned, murdered for their faith. Please do not delay any longer. Please protect your flock. Please consecrate Russia now before it is too late for us and even for yourself as the vision of the third secret foretells. Holy Father, we pray for you daily. Save us, save our children. Save yourself from the horrible chastisements prophesied by Jesus and Mary if you do not hasten to fulfill Our Lady of Fatima's request now. Holy Father, now is the time to show Our Lady of Fatima your trust in her and your obedience to her command.